If you would, uh, pull out your sermon outline out of your uh, bulletin. And we got a lot of work to do today, so let's get busy. Uh, Father, we give you thanks for this great, great grace that we enjoy, the wonderful privilege uh, to be able uh, to be together today. Thank you for the privilege to uh, worship you in song uh, today and uh, later on to worship you in our small group gatherings. Uh, Lord Jesus, you are the center of our lives, and uh, we pray that you would uh, just dominate that place in our hearts, that you would have your way in us today as we look at you, as we look at your word about you. Guide us, grow us. We would know Christ. We would know you. And so work and move in us. We're so easily distracted to what you've created rather than you. Guide us, grow us, have your way in us today. Thank you for your word. Thank you for coming to this planet. Thank you for teaching about us about yourself. Thank you for that death on the cross in our place. Your resurrection, your ascension, your session right now. You are sovereign Lord. Amen. If we could, let's, uh, this is part two of our Christmas series. Uh, it's designed to only have two parts, so this is the uh, second part uh, to it. And if we could, uh, let's return to our passage. Let's return back 2,000 years ago uh, to a little place called Bethlehem, which is right outside of Jerusalem, which is in Israel. Uh, actually about 2,000, what would it be, 20 years ago, roughly speaking, okay? This is the 2020 year of our Lord, soon to be 2021 year of our Lord. We mark our world calendars by this life, by, by God interrupting time and space. It's a big deal, and we know it. And so as we move into that stable 2,000 years ago, uh, putting ourselves there again, uh, got our tunics on, our sandals on. Uh, be careful you don't step in the poop because there's a lot of it and urine and all of that kind of thing. And welcome to the smell of a stable. And there we are in that stable and we peer into that little trough. And we've got, it was a big trough, but it's a little baby in that trough. And as we look into that trough, what, what do we see? Is it is it cute? That's the way it is at my house on the major scene. It's a very cute thing. Um, and that's kind of what our culture, oh, how, look how cute. If we can just keep Jesus cute, uh, you know, we're in good shape. Um, and yet, um, for some that know a little bit more about the story, it's sad. I mean, here's the Lord of the universe born into a stinking stable, no room for them with their extended family, which was in town. And for some who know the story even better from heaven's perspective, when you look in that little crib, it's awesome. What you're seeing is absolutely awesome. And so let's ask the question, forget what we see, what, what did God see? Now, now, picture, if you would, the Trinity, and this is real dangerous ground I'm on right now, but I know you'll say, go ahead and go for it. Uh, this is, you know, this is, okay, but imagine the Trinity, and it had to go something like this before time and space and matter and energy and everything was created, and God knew he was going to make you. He had a plan to come to the planet to interrupt life here and to display himself and to die for our sin. So he's got this plan. Now imagine being the Trinity, you're fleshing out this plan. And your goal is not just to go to a cross, but to reveal yourself in this plan. And so the Trinity is deciding what to do, if that's imaginable in the Trinity. And they go, okay, Jesus, let's give you a really common appearance. That's what Isaiah says. He was you know, common guy, and nothing to attract us to him in any way, shape, or form. Uh, let's give you common, really common parents. Let, let's give you a really common 
hometown. But, but let's make it even worse. Let's make sure that you're ostracized and you're made fun of your entire life for being born outside of wedlock. Yeah, that'll work. That'll, we're talking about revealing ourselves, our glory. Now let's make sure that you're born in a feeding trough. We can arrange that. Let's make sure that you become a refugee in, in Egypt for a while. And, and let's make sure that you live in about 30 years of absolute obscurity as a carpenter and a mason. And, and then let's do three and a half years of ministry where you loving folks, even your enemies serving them, sharing with them about the kingdom and, and, and the gospel. And then let's make sure we end the whole thing with you being despised and beaten and hung on a cross. That ought to work. That'll reveal our glory. Does it? Absolutely it does. Well, welcome to the God of the Bible. Not, not any God that we would ever create. There's no God on the planet created by men. All the religions of the world. This is a different God. And we'd never come up with this God. And the Bible says in John chapter 1, verse 1, In the beginning was the Word. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. In the that's the creator and sustainer. The mind behind the universe and the Greek mind. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, made everything, etc. And then verse 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld, listen now, his glory. We learned last week that's his awesomeness, his awesome character. We beheld, John saying with the other guys, we beheld the awesome character of God in the face of Christ. You know, the awesomeness of God. Look at Christ. And so that's what heaven's plan was. What did the angels see? That's our key passage that we're working out of. Luke chapter 2 and verse 8 and following. Same region of Bethlehem where Jesus was born. Some shepherds. Out in the field, they're watching their sheep. Angel comes before them. The glory of the Lord, our theme shown around them. They were scared to death. The angel probably radiated the glory of God, having been in God's presence. And the, the glory was shining around them. They had no place to go. Angel says, don't be afraid. I bring you good news, Noel, of a great joy for everybody. For in the city that's been born for you, for you, you shepherds and everybody else, a savior, one who's going to pay the penalty of your sin. They didn't get that at this time, but God did. The angels did. Who is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You'll find a baby wrapped in cloths and, and laying in a feeding trough. And then all of heaven overflows with the joy that is in heaven that comes from the character of God. We have a joyous God that brings joy into our lives and, and rejoices in bringing joy into our lives. And so the angels fill with joy because that's heaven, because that's our God, just overflows. And all of a sudden, the angels actually have themselves appear. God makes them appear. It's a multitude praising God and saying. So they're just singing. They're praising the, the, the boy, the, the voices. Can you imagine? God's blessed us with some great voices, but can you imagine? And they're singing this. I think at the top of their lungs with incredible ecstatic joy. It's not a few angels up in the sky like the cartoon. This is, this is the sky is filled with a multitude of them. They're praising God and saying, glory to God. What did the angels see? They saw the glory of God in that little baby. And they knew where that life was going to go to some degree or another. They knew where that life was going to go. Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among men with whom he is pleased. More on that last phrase uh, momentarily. So what is the glory of God? What do those angels see? What did God want to reveal to us? The glory of God, in, 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 in simplest words I know how to, how to put it, is his perfect radiating 
awesomeness. Don't always have to have the word radiating. They're just typical. There's a kind of a radiating of this awesomeness when the glory of God appears in the Bible, Old Testament, New Testament alike. But it's his perfect awesomeness. That's the root. Okay, uh, it's the awesome nature, the awesome person, the awesome character of God. That's his glory. And it's a it's not just awesome. It's a perfect awesomeness. He's perfect in every category, in every virtue. All right. So the glory of God is his perfect awesomeness, typically shown as radiating. All right, and how do we glorify God? By adoring Him for His perfect awesomeness and honoring Him in thought, in word, and in deed. That's how to glorify God. All right, so let's, uh, let's um, get into our outline now. Um, revelation of Christmas is God's perfect awesomeness. And so we looked last week at in that baby... In Christmas was the faithfulness of God, that all the prophecies, starting way back with Adam, that Jesus fulfilled every prophecy, showing the, the, the trustworthiness, the faithfulness of God. Number two, his power. Satan could not kill that little baby, and nothing's impossible with God, as the angel shared with, with Mary. And God dominated sin and death and brought it to an end through that little baby and the person he would grow up to become. And then number three, the justice of God is revealed. In that baby is the righteousness of God, that God might be just or righteous and the justifier of the one who has faith in Christ. God is just. He'll never let one sin go unpunished. God is the justifier. He took the punishment of our sin. Just and the justifier. So the righteousness of God is seen, or the justice of God is seen in that baby. And then number four, where we pick it up today... In that baby, as we look in that manger, who or what do we see? We see the awesomeness of God, but the awesomeness of God specifically in His wrath. Does anybody see when you look at your manger scene at home? Does anybody, as you, as you look at that, do you see the wrath of God there? You need to. You absolutely need to. The wrath of God's a, a strange thing to us because... Well, it's like my, like my uh, I think I used this illustration in a, in a life group a week or two ago. It's like, like our dog, Hobby. We had a little, a little Boston Bulldog. as a mutt. And when we were growing up out here on the beach. And that dog, when it got a chance, man, it would light off, go to the beach, and comb that beach looking for one thing. A dead fish. When it found a dead, rotting, stinking, the stinkier the better... It would dig its shoulder into that dead fish, try to rub that dead fish all over its body. All right? That's the nature of the dog. And then after doing so, he'd just come waltz, waltz him back and go, hey, pet me, hug me. He reeked of dead fish. That's his nature. And so we look at the wrath of God and we think, I'm a big guy. If somebody, you know, a little lie here, a little steal in there, a little whatever, I can get over it. It's not that big of a deal to me. Yeah, because I'm like hobby. Hello? Because I'm like my dog. Your sin's no big deal to me. It doesn't make me the better man. It makes me a little like Satan. Y'all you know, got to grab a hold of this, okay? I don't mean to bring a downer today, but we got to see the wrath of God as a beautiful thing because he took care of his wrath in that baby. Momentarily, we'll talk about that. As I see murder or a serial killer who goes around and kills people, just cold-blooded, absolute, outright murder. There's a certain thing in my heart that says justice needs to be served. That needs to be punished. So Y'all are going to relate with that, okay? Not a few mistakes. It's just outright, just hideous, horrible, horrific murder. And what we got to grab a hold of is a little white lie is more hideous to God than my view of serial first-degree murder. God's holy. I don't get that. But in the baby, we see the, whole, the, the, the holiness of God, the wrath of God, that sin is a big deal. And that's the, kind of the alarming part of, of Christmas, is Christmas happened because of my sin. That's why Christmas happened. That my sin was going to be punished by God. 
the thousands, the millions of sins I've committed. So heinous against God in God's sight. And so that, was, that sin is such a massive deal to God that he came here personally to pay the price and to bear my wrath on his own body. That I would never get one drop of the wrath of God. Not one drop, because Jesus drained every drop. That's what Christmas is about. And we've got to grab a hold of that. Christmas is about my sinfulness. And so 1 John chapter 4 and verse 9 and following. Uh, let me just do verse, well, let me do verse 9. By the, you have this in your, in your uh, sermon outline. Again, God intensely hates sin. Therefore, verse 9. By this, the love of God was revealed to us. His, his wrath and his love go hand in hand. And his love, the depth of his love is seen by the depth of his wrath. By this, the love of God was manifest in us that God sent his only begotten son into the world. That's Christmas. So that we might live through him. Well, how does that happen? How, how, do, we, how do we live through Jesus? In this is love. Not that we love God. We weren't lovable. But God chose to love us and sent his son, there's Christmas, to be the propitiation of our sin. Propitiation means wrath bearer. Why did Jesus come? He came to bear the wrath of God. Jesus is God and he came to bear the wrath of God. Hebrews 2.17, Jesus had to be made like his brothers. He calls us brothers. What a, what a, what a marvelous uh, concept that is. Jesus had to be made like his brothers in every way. That's Christmas, taking on humanness, that he might become, listen now, a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God and to make propitiation for the sins of the people. Jesus came specifically to bear the wrath of God in your place and in my place. So number four, we see the wrath of God in that little Manger, or we should say the bearer of the wrath of God, but that the wrath of God will be poured out on sin, and Jesus came to bear that wrath. Number five, a little easier for us to pout, we see the grace of God. Romans chapter 5 and verse 8. Christmas is about God's grace, his awesome grace. God demonstrates his own love toward us, or grace, his unmerited love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, just as a, as a people, 2,000 years ago, it's true today, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Christmas is about Christ coming when we're sinners to die for us. Much more than having been justified or made righteous or being completely forgiven by his blood. What was Christmas about for Jesus to have blood, to shed his blood in our place? That we might be saved from the wrath of God. There you go. What's Christmas about? Saving us from the wrath of God through Jesus. Verse 10, for while we were enemies, notice verse 8, while we were sinners, verse 10, while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God. That means we were at enmity with God, but God uh, uh, brought about a friendship by taking care of our, the barrier, which is sin, by Jesus bearing the wrath of himself, uh, uh, of God on, on his body. We were reconciled to God through the death of his son. And having much more been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. What's Christmas about? It's about the love of God, the grace of God, the one who came to bear his own wrath. That's, that's, this is hard stuff. I admit that. And yet, if we're going to know God, these are the things that we grapple with in our minds. Number six, when we look into that little manger, when we see that baby, what do we see? We adore and honor God for his fatherliness. That reveals the fatherhood of God. So far, we've kind of talked about uh, the, the justice God. And that God's, God's a judge, but he's a merciful, gracious judge. And, and now we step into this whole thing of fatherhood. It shows the fatherhood of God. Verse 4. When the fullness of time came, that would be 2,000, 20 years ago, roughly speaking. God sent forth his son. That would be Christmas. Born of a woman. That would be Mary. Born under the law, that would be the Ten Commandments and the other laws. In order, so why did Christmas happen? In order that he might redeem those who were under the law, that would be you and me, that would be everybody, that we might receive, what's Christmas about? Adoption as sons. Jesus came that we might be adopted into the family of God. 
taking care of the sin problem, redeeming us from us selling ourselves into sin. Verse 6, because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit of his son, Jesus, into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father, or Daddy, Father. And that's what happens when we first trust Christ. We're, we're, we're made aware that God is now our Father. He's the judge who has forgiven us forever. And now he's our Father. We're adopted into his family. And so our first words are Daddy, or Dad, Dad, would be probably the best translation of Abba. Dad, Dad, Father. And that's, who he, and that's uh, exactly who he is because of Christmas uh, and Christmas leading to the cross. Therefore, you're no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. We inherit it all. What's Christmas about? Sonship. The fatherhood of God. The family of believers. Number seven, when we look into that little manger, what do we see? What do we adore and honor God for? His patience. Now think about Israel. <laughs> you you want to read, I mean, about a patient. God, oh, God was so wrathful in the Old Testament. Like, really? I mean, seriously? Like, the page generation after generation after generation after generation. I mean, God just grace, 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 all the way through. Just great. He brought, he brought chastisement. He brought correction. But just, in, you know, patience. Pa uh, yeah, why are they still around? You know what I'm saying? When, in 2,000 years ago. Uh, everybody else has gone away. You know, why are they still there? Because of God's covenant relationship with them. Because of his patience. And then you think of the disciples. Gee, I'm talking about revealing the character of God. <laughs> could you, could you, if you read one of the Gospels, imagine being Jesus. I mean, these guys commonly were just completely clueless as to what was going on after they'd been told the third, fourth, or fifth time about something. Just was, you know, just, um, they were coming along. And later on, we'll read a passage. They did glorify Jesus in, in, their, in their hearts and actions and words. But, I mean, so often they were just completely missing the point. And that's patience. On the, that's revealing the patience of God working with us. Aren't you glad that we have a very patient God? Hello? Right? Okay. <laughs> you know, I'm glad I got a really, really patient wife and a really, really patient family. And I'm glad I got a really, really patient God. And so we have these words. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 17. Um, he had, Jesus had to be made, made like his brother in, in all things, that would be Christmas, that he might become the merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, which he was, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. Uh, that's revealing the wrath of God. God's, God's nature to punish sin was fulfilled by Jesus being punished in our place. We just read that. Now the next verse, for since he himself was tempted in that which he suffered, and Jesus suffered mockery growing up and all kinds of things. And certainly he suffered toward the end of his life uh, before the, uh, the, the courts. Uh, in that which he suffered, he is able to come to the aid of those who were so tempted. Why did Jesus come? So that we can know he gets it. Now he's inside of us, he gets it anyway. But because he went through similar things, we can know that we know that we know that our God, our Lord Jesus Christ, gets stuff gets difficulties, gets people, people hurting us and desiring to kill us and spreading rumors about us and just all the bad things that take place. Jesus gets all of that. And so he's able to come to the aid of us who are tempted that way and to do so patiently. You know, a lot of, uh, a lot of preachers uh, that I talk with, they don't do counseling. They <laughs> don't do i do I, I love to sit down with people whatever the issue is but a lot a lot don't i'm not saying that to toot my horn but i get why they don't because it takes a ton of patience to work with people and for anybody to work with me it takes a ton of patience as well it just takes patience to work with people and jesus displayed the patience of god while he was here with those disciples and that patience remains to this day uh, number eight, what's the, uh, what's the manger all about? What's the incarnation? What's that little baby in that, in that, uh, th that um, uh, um, feeding trough all about? It's about the holiness of God. Hebrews 4, verse 14, uh, the, the two chapters later uh, from the pa passage we just read. Since then we have a great high priest, just made that plain. Jesus is our, the, the, the mediator between us and God, the Father. He is God. He is also human. 
since he is our great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, passed through the heavens, that means Christmas came to dwell inside of Mary, passed through the heavens, that's Christmas. Because that's the, that's, that's the case, we have that kind of high priest. Let us hold fast our confession or our holding on to him. We don't have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. Uh, I can turn that around and say, we have a high priest who can sympathize with our weaknesses. He does get it. We have one who has been tempted in all the ways that we're tempted, but he never sinned. Because of that, let us hold and draw near with confidence to the throne of grace. His throne is a, he's reigning today. He's the king, but it's a throne of grace that we might receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. What's, what, what's he saying here? Because he was tempted, but he never sinned, we can draw near to him with confidence. We say, what? but he doesn't get it. He never sinned. So he, he can't relate with me. Oh, just think about this for a second, okay? If you're an athlete and you're lifting weight, right? And you got, um, you know, for me it's 25 pounds, but maybe for you it's like, like 200 pounds on the barbell, right? And you're going up and down, okay? And, and then after a while, you do what? You're, you're, the coach is with you and you're going, go, one more, one more, one more. And what do you do? That's it, I'm done. I, I'm, just, I'm just done. You know, and you give up, right? Or if you're a runner and you're running with your coach who's just a super athlete and you're just, you're, you're on the beach, you're running in the water, you're, you know, you're training and you're just, you're just, you're sucking air and the coach goes, come on, come on, we can do it, come on, one more mile, come on, come on. And you go, I'm done. And you just fall on your face. I'm, I'm done. D does that coach understand what you're going through? Or if you're in, in the academics and you're crunching a problem, and you're working on hours and hours and hours, and your academic coach is going, come on, come on, you can keep going. Finally, your brain just goes to mush. You go, I'm done. I'm, you know, and whatever the discipline is, when it comes to morality, when it comes to sin, Jesus never caved. He's the only one who gets the weight of sin, because he never caved to it, ever, not one time. So he gets it. So when we come to him in time of need, that means time of sin, we know that we have a Lord, a king that gets it. All right. So in that manger, we see the patience of God. In that manger, we see the wisdom of God. And I don't have time to go through all this. But we're going to be in this book before too long. I think the book of Ephesians and Jesus came, verse 10 of Ephesians chapter 3, that the manifold wisdom of God might be made known through the church to the angelic beings that are watching. This was in accordance with his eternal purpose, way back before he made time and space, which he carried out in Christ Jesus our Lord. What's Christmas about? Revealing the manifold, the multifaceted wisdom of God. What, what do we mean by that? The, 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 the wisdom of God. What's this passage about? Without reading the whole thing, and I would encourage you to read that on your own. Um, it's about God making everyone one in Christ. The Christ is the center. He's our great identity. You might be a jock, the person next to you, or the aisle over might be a geek, and a whatever, whatever. Uh, you might be black, they're, they're white, the green person's in front of you, and a blue person's behind you. You can be one in Christ by, if Jesus is your greatest identity, not that you're female, not that you're male, not that you're gray, not that you're, that you're yellow. Those that won't come out good, but you know what I'm saying, okay? Um, it, 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 the, the, your great identity is Christ. If you're united to Christ, I'm united to Christ, therein is the wisdom of God that we be made one. Much more on that, not in this sermon, but later on. Uh, in that manger, we see the humility of God. We honor and adore God for his humility, which is not another thing that we kind of, when we think of God, we, maybe we don't think of humility. Uh, Mark chapter 10, verse 45. The Son of Man, Jesus is speaking about himself, called himself the Son of Man. He's the Son of God. He's the Son of Man. He's divine, he's human. The Son of Man, referring to himself, didn't come to be served. Just grab, grab a hold of that. Jesus is going, I didn't come to the planet to be served. I don't exist today to be served. I didn't come to be served. I came 
to serve and to give my life a ransom for many. I didn't come to be served, I came to serve. That's the heart of God. He's revealing the glorious nature of God, the humility of God. Humility is not putting ourselves down. God does not put himself down. Humility is putting others by choice above ourselves. We're called to have his mind, to have that kind of humility. That's tough stuff. Philippians chapter 2, verse 5, have this mindset in you which was in Christ. He existed in the very form God. He was equal with God, but he emptied himself taking the form of a servant and humbled himself all the way to the ultimate servanthood, which is the point of death on the cross. And so we see the humility of God on that little baby's face in that, in that manger. Uh, and God, again, you look at the whole way God did that, back to our opening conversation, that's the humility of God on display. Number 11, we see the joy of God. Again, we have a joyous God, and we've got to grab a hold of that. I, there's too many wonderful theologians that just, they got everything down, but they have, there's nothing in their commentaries on the joy of God, and that's just baffling to me. It's just like, what? How, like, how does that work? God is a joyous God. And it, it, we talked about his wrath. We talked about his, we haven't talked about it, but we, in the past we talked about his, you know, Jesus was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. He hurt uh, for, for God being blasphemed. He hurt what's, what, for, for people what sin does to people. And it's painful. He mourned over that. At the same time, he was joyous. And so is heaven that way today. Uh, the angel said, Luke chapter 2, I bring you good news of great joy. Uh, God, uh, God's going, I'm bringing you great joy. A Savior's been born for you. And then the angels came and they all manifested themselves. And they were saying, what, glory to God in the highest. And they were not saying that in some, some they weren't mumbling that. That was a joyous sound. All of heaven, can you imagine the thundering uh, voices of all those angels together? Glory to God in the highest. Tremendous joy. And Jesus said, John chapter 15, looking at the person of Jesus as, as, uh, as John and the disciples would, John 15 is happening right before he's going to be arrested that night and die on a cross the next day. He knows that. He's been telling them that. And with that, the weight of that on his shoulders, he says these words to them. Hours before the cross. These things I have spoken to you, I've been teaching you, that my joy might be in you. Can you imagine that? He's going to a cross, and mixed with the pain of anticipation of bearing the wrath of God in our place, there's still joy. And so, so we're multifaceted creatures made in the image of God. We can have great pain and, and sorrow and great joy at the same time. And so does God. God is, a, God is in great pain right now. He's made himself vulnerable by choosing to love us. And he's got great joy and heaven's a place of great joy. And we've got to hold those in balance and go both are fine and good and right in, in, in your godly life. I want my joy to be in you when you're facing you know, certain death and an agonizing death. I want you to know my joy is what he's saying here. Heaven, again, is a place of great joy. Uh, one little illustration on this. I got time for this because I've got one more after this. Um, I think uh, there's a, a bunch of places I want to go in my mind, but um, First Chronicles, where you've recently been, not Corinthians, Chronicles, First Chronicles, uh, back in the Old Testament, um, we got this going on. In chapter 13, uh, David has been made king right before that in Chronicles, and he's wanting to take the, this, this ark, this box kind of thing, where the Ten Commandments are and a few other things, um, re, you know, the, the, basically, um, uh, um, you know, it's the law of God. And he's wanting to move that to Jerusalem, uh, the capital city. And uh, so he starts to do that in chapter 13. Something goes bad, which we, need, we can talk about later on, which is really important uh, that we don't uh, do things in a wrong way before our God. Uh, but then in chapter 15, we have these words. They got together again and continued to move this ark. And he appointed singers, that's David and the people helping him. This is verse 16 of 1 Chronicles 15. Singers with instruments of music, including stringed instruments, 
loud sounding symbols that common word that that word loud is commonly attached to loud sounding symbols uh, to raise so you got you got these stringed instruments and loud sounding symbols why so loud to raise sounds of joy thus all Israel brought up the ark of the covenant of the Lord with shouting so they are they are singing there's loud uh, 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 instruments going they're shouting shouts of joy as they travel with the law of God toward Jerusalem and it also says in verse 28, they had horns and trumpets, more loud sounding cymbals and more stringed instruments. And as they were going, David is, is, is with them, the king, and he is leaping and making merry. He, the guy just having a blast, just joyously, listen now, glorifying God. Loudly, with dancing, horns, cymbals, all. And Michael, a wife, looks at him from a window and she despised him for that kind of joy. If you want to, you can read about God's opinion of Michael despising him. We're a people of great joy. We're people uh, that get together and we fast and we pray and we cry and we mourn over sin. And where there's a brokenness to us. But we're a people that's very celebrative. And we kind of got to know the occasion. And both of those always are, resign are always in our hearts. And so when we gather and it's very somber, it's right and it's good. And God manifests that. But when we gather and there's loud sounding cymbals and all the rest... And we're shouting with shouts of joy. Don't despise that. That's glorifying God. You know, we're all of that. Because God is. Our God is. And he revealed that uh, in that manger. Uh, number 12. Peace. God came to bring us peace. And he is a God of peace. Jesus said this right before going to the cross in chapter 14 of John. Verse 27. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives. You know, which is just contingent on how things are going. Don't let your heart be troubled. Don't let it be fearful. I'm giving you my peace by way of my teaching. As you take it in and practice it, you'll experience my peace. He's going to a cross, and he's at peace about going to a cross. And, and all the way through, he never freaks out. Soldiers come, he goes to the garden, the guys are sleeping, whatever. He's always, always just always in charge. Soldiers come. They, he allows himself to be arrested, taken, brutalized, and, 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 and eventually hung on a cross. And the entire time, never freaking out. Never uttering threats. A total peace. Why? Maybe because even though he was in, a, he was in a, a, an emptied state, so to speak, of certain divine prerogatives, and we don't get all of that, but to some degree or another, he gave that back to the Father. and just tried. Maybe it's because he had a God that he trusted. Maybe that was the reason for his peace. And so when the Lord says, peace I give you, and in, in, our, um, in our passage in, 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 in Luke, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace among men with whom he is pleased. How do we please God? By trusting Christ as, as, our, as our Savior. What does that peace look like? And we're going to close with this, uh, with this thought. In John 17, we have uh, Jesus' uh, prayer right before going to the garden to be arrested and then uh, hung on a cross. And evidently, he, he's communicating with God out loud so John and others can hear uh, what he's saying. And so he's saying for their encouragement, but he's, he's letting them in on the conversation with the Father. And he begins uh, chapter 17, the whole thing's a prayer, begins 17 with, with asking God to glorify him in what's upcoming and for him to be able to glorify God in what's upcoming. Can God be glorified by the b b brutality and death on a cross? Yeah. It reveals everything we just got done talking about. The glory of God is seen on the cross. And if I had time, we could certainly go into that item by item, uh, just like in the manger. And so it's a prayer about the glory of God being manifest. And then he says in verse 10 that the disciples, as, as clueless as they were many of the time, much of the time, they've glorified me uh, as they've received some of it and adored me and honored me. And then he gives these, these words. 
chapter 17, the end, toward the end of this, uh, this time of prayer, he, he says this, verse 20, I, I, I don't ask what I'm fixing to ask in behalf of these disciples alone, but for all who would believe in me through their word, that would be you and me. Verse 20, uh, uh, verse 21, here's what I'm requesting, Father, that they all may be one, even as you, Father, are in me and I'm in you, where you were connected together spiritually, that they also may be in us, they may be connected to us, united with us. I want them to be one, I want them to be united to us, and that is their oneness. And I want the world to believe through their oneness. Next verse. And the glory, now, let, now pay, pay close attention to this. Again, we're bringing, we're, we've got three minutes left. And the glory which you have given to me, I have given to them. Does anybody get that? Ever read that and you just go, ah, it blows my mind. The glory that I have, I've given to them. I've given them my glory. Like, what's he talking about? The reason he's doing it, that they might be one. So I want them to be one. I want them to be in us. I want them to be one. Just as we are one, as the Trinity is one, I want them to be one. So I'm giving them my glory. Indeed, verse 23 we're united with them that they might be perfected in unity. And then the world sees that and believes. So he's saying, I'm giving them my glory that they may all be one. Boy, it's a horrendous thing for us to let any, any, two, any two believers get out of sorts. Never let it happen. Never let it happen. Never let it happen. Christ came in that little manger that we might be one with the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, united to them forever and also united to each other. And the marvelous, awesome character of God comes to live inside of us. And when that happens, how can we not pursue unity and do whatever it takes to be tight with one another how is that possible and so as we behold second corinthians chapter 3 verse 18 as we behold the glory of the lord and i just give this a homework assignment second corinthians chapter 3 verse 18 through chapter 4 as we behold the glory of the lord we are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory there's a lot of stuff I said today that's kind of smoke in my mind. Okay, if your brain hurts, I, I got it. This is recorded. You can go back over it and, and pick it apart and let me know, okay? Um, um, but, you know, we're being transformed from glory to glory as we behold the glory of the Lord. And then verse 6 of chapter 4, and I wish I had time to do all this in context, but this is the last verse. The one who said light will shine out of darkness is the one who has shown in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. As we behold the face of Christ in that manger and on that cross and everything in between, we see the glory of God. We behold these, and I've only mentioned 12 attributes. There's many, many others. But I figure 12 days of Christmas, 12 attributes, you know. So I, I chose some of my favorites, all right? Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for your grace to us. Thank you for this marvelous, marvelous privilege we have to be together today. And uh, we pray, uh, Father, that you would grow us in the knowledge of the glory of Christ as we see his face we see the glory of God one and the same the glory of the Holy Spirit the glory of the Father you're awesome you're perfect awesome character in every way you're perfect and all that's bundled up in that little manger 2,000 years ago and all of that was manifested during the life and ministry and death and resurrection of Christ and ascension. Lord Jesus, we adore you and we want to live lives that honor you 
and thank you for your grace, your presence, your, 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 your patience every step of the way. And guide us in your purpose to unify with one another, what, what, just whatever it takes, and to be a witness to this world as we do, to open our mouths and to share the glory of Christ with others, this glorious gospel. Thank you for grace today. In Jesus' name, amen. If you've not trusted Christ, we beg you to do that. This area will be open. I'm going to grab a mask in just a moment. You don't need to have one on. I'm going to grab one. Uh, God bless each one of you. God make you a blessing.